as Emil mentioned, at last year's SRECon, there was a talk that introduced uh, fault treated analysis. That's where I found out about it. Before I begin, I want to tell you a little story from my childhood that kind of relates to what motivated me to embark on this journey. I grew up in New York City all the way from first grade until I finished college. I remember a winter day when I was in middle school when a weather forecast came out. The weather forecast called for eight inches of snow. School was scheduled the next day. However, due to the weather forecast, the entire city panicked and closed down schools. Lucky for me, I didn't do my homework for that day, so I got to do it during the school day. However, when the day actually came, only two inches of snow fell, if even, and the weather forecasters sort of got embarrassed. The day I went to school after the failed snow day, I opened up the newspaper like I do every day, and I don't remember if this was the New York Post or the Daily News, but there was a cartoon depicting a bunch of weather forecasters in a room. They were in a classroom. At the front of the room was a weather forecaster holding a dart in his hand. At the very other end of the room, there was a couple of dart boards with weather forecasts on it. And that weather forecaster was essentially teaching other weather forecasters, hey, you gotta throw dart boards at the board to get your forecasts. That cartoon kind of stayed ingrained in my brain over time, where any meeting that deals with defining service level objectives for your service made me feel fear that I'd look like one of these weather forecasters if I get my SLOs wrong. When I joined Lyft a little over seven months ago, I was drawn into meetings to define SLOs for Kafka. I, we, we were kind of struggling with it, and I remembered, huh, there's this fault tree analysis thing that I learned at SRECon last year. Maybe we can apply it. I'll begin this talk by first talking about why Kafka is important, what we want to quantify about it, and why. After that, I will introduce fault tree analysis and give you a tutorial on how to apply it. We'll then take those basics and apply it to the meat of the talk, which is drawing fault trees for Kafka in order to de determine the availability SLO and data durability SLO. And finally, I'll hopefully conclude with some references, takeaways, as well as thoughts for the future. So first things first, why, why do we care about Kafka being reliable? For Companies that deal with moving a lot of data around, such as Lyft, Kafka is a reliability tool for us. What I mean by that is when we move data around, we want to minimize data loss. When I was a young engineer, I naively thought, well, why do we need a system to handle our messages? Why can't we just send messages point to point? After all, it's the fastest way to go from point A to point B. What I quickly learned is that there's a large class of failure scenarios that you have to worry about. Are your producers too, too fast for your consumers, for example? Or are you going to want to upgrade your consumers while your producers continue pushing traffic? Again, because we're, a lot of our companies are in the business of moving data around in some shape or form, Kafka becomes something that has high stakes usage. I'm very example driven, and one of the examples I like to give of a critical use case for Kafka is observability data. If your machines in your data center or in your cloud environment are emitting metrics and logs, and you want those metrics and logs to go to a number of sources so that you can analyze them, any slowdown that you have with any of this data or any data loss 
will slow down your ability to respond to actual problems happening to the machines that you're observing. Another use case is event streaming. If your mobile apps or your websites are tracking events as your users uh, tap or click through your, your applications, any loss in this might hamper functionality that you're providing to the users or slow down your deci business decision-making processes. So we've kind of laid out that Kafka is super critical. What do we want to measure, and why do we want to measure reliability of Kafka? We can't say that Kafka is just going to be 100% reliable. There's, it's very, I mean, you, you, Kafka supports replication and redundancy, and we can add a lot of replication as much as we want, but at a certain cost. The better we're able to quantify the probability of success based on the inputs into our Kafka setup, the more opportunities we can find to trim cost. For example, instead of maybe replicating four times, maybe we can add some memory to our producers so that when we suffer um, a blip in outage, the producers can have a backlog and survive. Or maybe we reduce the memory on the producers and have more replication on, on our brokers. These are all drawbacks that we want to get answers to, and we'll get better answers the better we can hone in on a number of metrics. When you build SLOs for a service, you need to think about what, from the perspective of the things using the service, what do they care about? For Kafka, we identified the following three things, availability, durability, and latency. And if there are better Kafka experts than me out there, let us know if we missed anything or got any of these wrong. The first is availability. What's the probability that writes or reads to Kafka fail? And more importantly, how long of a downtime do we have to tolerate in the worst case? The second service level objective is durability. Once we write data to Kafka, we don't want to lose any of that data before we consume it from any of our consumers. Some of the questions we want to answer is how much of that data will we lose? How much time should we give our consumers to consume it, et cetera? And third, we care about latency. You can have a very reliable system that, that gets your messages from point A to point B, but if it's too slow, we lose a lot of the value from it. So let's now go in and run through a tutorial of fault tree analysis. Fault tree analysis is deductive failure analysis, and it was invented at Boeing in 1962. Boeing engineers at the time were designing launch control systems for ICBMs. If you want to talk about high stakes usage, this is it. If, if your launch control system fails, not only will you potentially friendly fire on yourself, but you could lose an entire war. Engineers at Boeing wanted to have a framework to do a couple of things. First, they wanted to have a way to list out all the potential failure modes or failure inputs into their systems. Second, they wanted a way to quantify which of these failure modes and, and inputs they should prioritize and shore up in order to make their system reliable. The technique was very successful and has since been adopted by the aerospace, military, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, and many other industries. The first thing you need to know about fault tree analysis is that you'll be dealing with some terminology, some symbols. We're not going to go over all of the symbols, but we're, we'll use the following three. The first symbol is a basic um, event. A basic event is a starting point 
that triggers a chain reaction and usually is associated with some probability of failure. Another event symbol is an intermediate event. Intermediate events chain groups of basic events together or describe one basic event. The third event that we'll use is a transfer event. If you're used to programming, a transfer event is kind of like a programming function. It allows you to take trees or subtrees of your fault trees and effectively plop them into other places in your, in your fault tree. For example, if you have some sort of shared dependency, you can use a transfer gate for that. Sorry, a transfer event for that. The other set of symbols are gate symbols. Gate symbols signify how basic events or intermediate events join up together and how they interact with each other. In this talk, we're going to cover only OR gates and AND gates. There, as you can imagine, there are gates such as XOR and NORs, but we, we're going to keep things simple and, and wind up not using those. So let's first explain what an OR gate is. The example that is a good use case for an OR gate is RAID 0. RAID 0 is a disk array that allows you to write data that will be striped across all of the disks in that array. In this example, there are three disks. And crucially, if you lose any one of these disks, you will lose your array. In this example, you won't be able to write to the array if you lose any of these disks. An OR gate communicates that, that same thing. The next step we need to take after we've drawn out how our thing works is to define a probability of failure for our basic events. In this case, we have one type of basic event, which is a disk failure. We're assuming these are rotational disks. And generally speaking, the upper reasonable upper bound for failure that we've, we use for rotational disks is 4%. If you, it's a little bit more nuanced in reality than that. If you read Google's 2007 paper about failure, their analysis of failures of rotational disks, they follow a bathtub curve where when you get them from the manufacturer, they have a higher rate of failure. Then the failure decreases after you've weeded out those disks. And then it rises again after a couple of years. Again, we're going to simplify here and just say 4% going forward for rotational disks. The other thing to keep in mind is the time frame for your failure. This is 4% annual failure rate AFR for a rotational disk. Standard probability theory for or scenarios is to add up the probabilities and subtract the product of those probabilities. When you're applying fault tree analysis, you're allowed to take some shortcuts. One shortcut to avoid having to calculate um, a lot of numbers together is you can chop off the product of the probabilities. Because if those probabilities are small, as you'll see if you crunch the numbers yourself, you, you still get your reasonable upper bound for your overall failures, and you're going to be chopping off a small amount that's immaterial to what you're trying to do. So you're allowed to chop that off if you're applying fault tree analysis. When you crunch the number for numbers for RAID 0, we get a 12% annualized chance of failure for your RAID 0 array. Not, not exactly something I would trust in production. The corollary is an AND gate. And an AND gate is something you can apply to a RAID 1 array. A RAID 1 array is mirror RAID at the expense of disk capacity you mirror data across all of the disks in the array. In this case, we have three disks. So we mirror all the writes across all three disks as they're getting written. 
the formula to compute an AND gate is standard probability theory to multiply out the probabilities. Once we crunch those numbers and subtract that from one, we get four nines chance of success. Note that we subtracted from one because the probabilities get very small and we're more used to, at least in SRECon, to compute number of nines of, of things. There's one caveat though. The, the, the four nines of chance of success is the chance of success if we don't remediate any, any of these disks. The whole point of ra running redundant rate arrays is to give yourself a chance to replace them when they fail. We get four nines if we leave the disks alone. You lose one disk one day, maybe five months later you lose another disk, and then you lose a third disk and then, and then you get the failure. So we need to set a remediation rate. At home, I have a three-day remediation rate for my server. Even when I'm out of town, I've trained all of my family members to replace disks. <laughs> if a disk fails, they call me up, or, or I get an alert, I call them up, they go to Best Buy, buy the right disk, I tell them which one to replace, they plug it in, and then the data copies over within another day. If we consistently remediate within three days, our chance of success increases significantly which is really good, because instead of running RAID 1 with three disks, we can run it with one disk and still have a very high chance of success. The way we come up with the number with the remediation rate is to follow this formula. If you're allergic to math, don't worry, I'm not gonna speak the, the top formula out loud, but for fault tree analysis fortunately gives us another shortcut we can apply. If your probabilities are less than 10%, you can multiply the probability of A by the probability, probability of T, sorry, probability of B, and multiply it by your rate of remediation by the number of probabilities you're computing with. For, for our remediation rate that we used before, it was three divided by 365. So now, we've, now that we have the basics covered, Let's dive into the meat of the talk, which is defining availability SLOs for Kafka. Let's say that we want to target four nines of success rate per year on our Kafka brokers. The first step we'll take is let's start simple and have a single broker and a single zookeeper. Let's also assume that our brokers are running on rotational disks. So, We've already discussed rotational disk failure rate at 4%. We'll go with that. Our brokers are on a network, the, and our networks, as we observe, are 2%, have a 2% failure rate. Again, depending on your environment, you might have higher or lower um, network failure rates. Your hardware might fail. We attribute another 1% to that. And then you might have OS faults. The Linux kernel is a big beast. Operators make mistakes, misconfigurations. We attribute that for, this, for simplicity at 1% as well. Next, we need to determine the failure rate of Zookeeper. Generally speaking, you run Zookeepers on solid state disks, at least that's the recommendations that I, I've gotten. It also runs on hardware, which is gonna be susceptible to network partitions, OS faults, and hardware failure. When we crunch the numbers out, we get a 4.8% chance of zookeeper failure, 8% chance, uh, chance of failure on our single broker, with an overall 12.8% chance of failure if we're using a single broker. Not very good for production. Because the broker has the higher rate of uh, chance of failure and Kafka happens to have replication features, we can run with two brokers. We'll keep the zookeeper alone for now, 
we'll use our first transfer gate to designate that we have a shared zookeeper that is applied across both brokers. This also saves us uh, some math. We'll do a little bit more refactoring. Again, our zookeeper transfer gate designates that we have a shared zookeeper. We create another transfer gate for non-disk host failure. And one more transfer gate for a rotational um, disk, um, a host with rotational disk failure, which is what the Kafka brokers are using. We then plug in our probabilities that we've determined before, and we come out with a significantly higher chance of success. The next highest fa failing thing is Zookeeper because we're only running one. We'll add three Zookeepers because the general wisdom is to add Zookeepers in odd sets. Once you crunch the numbers for after adding Zookeepers, we now get the two nines of availability. We're, we're, getting, we're, we're getting better. Next, we'll see what happens when we add a third broker. When we add a third broker, we get three, three and a half nines of success. We're getting much closer to our four nines. If we summarize where we are so far, we've in succession gotten to higher availability. If we try, for example, three zookeepers, we don't see an improvement in our, in our success probability. So from this, we kind of, you know, do we throw more money at zookeepers? Probably not. Another thing that's confusing about Kafka is your in-sync replica count, ISR. If your ISR is one, then you can suffer a broker outage and still uh, write to your cluster. With ISR2, because you're, you're requesting Kafka maintain mo more than one um, in-sync replica, losing a single broker causes you to stop uh, writing. As a result, you kind of drop down to as if you have two brokers in that case. So your best bang for your buck is to run with three brokers and three zookeepers from what fault tree analysis is telling us. We can get to four nines by using SSDs. SSDs have a lower chance of failure rate and significantly boost. They, they, get, they get us to our targeted success of four nines. Another option is to run EBS. EBS is more expensive, but the failure rate is only 0.2% based on what AWS says. So we've covered availability. Let's dive into durability. Let's see if we can get to seven nines of durability on our Kafka clusters. For durability, we need to remember what we did for RAID 1. We first identified a remediation rate. Your remediation rate with Kafka will depend on how much data a single broker has and what your replication is. Because when you have a broker that goes sour and you replace it with another one, you need to wait for data to copy. If you use a D2X large instance on AWS, which has six terabytes of data and roughly a 70 megabyte per second replication rate, it takes 24 hours to replace a full broker. If we start with two brokers and assume that there's, for simplicity, one six terabyte disk, and we remember the time-based formula, right off the bat, we get past our seven nines of durability. We're doing great right off the bat. This is good. However, AWS doesn't give you a single six terabyte disks. It gives you three two terabyte disks. In order to maximize um, the, the amount of disk space, we'll RAID zero these disks because we, can, we, we had a very high guarantee before. So now we drop down a few nines, a little bit below our target of seven nines. This is a little out of our comfort zone. 
For availability, we identify that we wanted three brokers, so we might as well jump up to three brokers. And that's good because that, that means we get more durability if we stay, keep everything else the same. Now here's a little tricky decision that we might have to make with our Kafka clusters. Our Kafka clusters might become very successful, and we need to keep scale, scaling them horizontally. At a certain point, you might need to scale them up. 200 Kafka brokers is the rule of thumb where you should maybe scale them up, as you know, I've, I've been told. If we scale up to the largest D2 instance, which I, which I believe is the D2 at 8x large, those have 48 terabytes per broker split across two terabyte disks. This is interesting because now, because you've sized up your brokers, in the worst case, it might take you eight days to replicate a full broker, assuming your replication rate is the same. This is, gonna, this is kind of nuanced because you might have a retention period of four days. So you know, you'd, you'd have to kind of determine your remediation rate based on your retention um, policy. But let's assume that it's the full eight days. We now are doing RAID 0 with 24 disks. On AWS, it doesn't matter anyway, because when a single disk gets lost, you lose your entire host anyway. So with 24 disks on these sized up brokers, with an eight-day re re um, uh, re remediation rate, our durability guarantee goes down significantly. So just by making one change, we get out of our comfort zone. So kind of to summarize, your best bang for the buck is to stay on smaller brokers as much as possible because on failure scenarios, you can recover so much more, so much quicker from, from failures. One SLO that we haven't covered is latency. Fault, applying fault tree to latency is a little tricky. I don't know if it's possible because latency isn't an explicit failure. It's not really an inherent failure. Latency just says, ah, it, it, things are a little slow, but they still succeed. My recommendation is to define your latency SLOs is to experiment with worst case scenarios that your users might throw at your cluster. If you have service protection and quotas on your system, determine what those quotas are and what the comfort levels for those quotas are based on how much traffic you can push on a single broker before your latency start going up. So if if you're in the back of the room and you had trouble reading the diagrams, don't fret. You don't need to go to an eye doctor. You can go to afalco slash FTA Kafka on GitHub and view the diagrams at your preferred zoom level. The open source tool that I use to draw the diagrams is Rakimov slash Scram on GitHub as well. Um, the talk that uh, the talk that I um, mentioned that inspired this, this talk from last year's SRECon is linked here as well. Fault tree analysis can be applied to uh, determine availability and durability SLOs for Kafka and perhaps other components. It helped us. It helps you find cost savings. And it helps you uncover decisions that you might make that might reduce your liability. Some of the things that um, we want to analyze in the future is running, what happens when you run Kafka on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is another system with its own set of faults. And it's important to understand how those faults can, can affect your Kafka systems. For example, what happens if you do a rolling Kubernetes update at the same time that you trigger a rolling Kafka restart. If you want to roll up your sleeves and contribute to an open source project, 
I encourage you to improve Scram PRA, which is the tool that I, that I use to draw those diagrams. And finally, at Lyft, we do a lot of distributed tracing. We have rich data about how components talk to each other and their rates of failure. If we map distributed tracing um, diagrams to fault trees, we'll be able to potentially either find places where we're not um, doing distributed tracing analysis, or we can find opportunities to hone in and fix the component that might be causing the most failure. Thank you all for tuning in. I'll be, I think I'm out of time, so I'll be available elsewhere in the conference if you want to come up to me in person and ask any questions. Thank you all very much. <laughs>